Thanks for joining me. I'm Anthony Reid from the Geological Survey of South Australia here to talk about using indicator minerals as vectors towards nickel mineralisation. And I'm joined by Dr. Louise Schonenveld, who's a research scientist from the CSIRO in Perth. Thanks, Louise. Could you give us an idea about what is an indicator mineral? I mean, I know the diamond industry uses indicator minerals all the time, but just, just the concept of what is an, in, an indicator mineral. Oh, so indicator minerals are a mineral, mineral that indicates something. So in the term of diamond indicator minerals, what they're indicating is the correct pressure and temperature for diamonds to form. So these are usually the garnets that everyone are familiar with. They're called a G10 garnet. And they're these beautiful like red and purple colors. And this color is actually given by the chemistry. So you're using your eyes to determine what chemistry the garnet is and to know that you're in a region that has kimberlite pipes that are producing these garnets, which are at the correct pressure and temperature that diamonds also form. So you know you're in a, in a region that could contain diamonds. Yeah. And then... Usually you just sort of follow the breadcrumb trail of these indicator minerals yeah, yeah, yeah. toward the deposit. So you the just source. follow it until there's more and more and more until you find what you're looking for. Find what you're looking for. So in, now kimberlites are the sort of uh, the environment in which uh, diamonds might form, but nickel deposits are slightly different to that. Can you just give us an idea of a little bit of a background on how most nickel deposits form? What should we be looking for? Sure. So our little recipe for making a nickel deposit is you need a mafic or ultra mafic magma that's flowing through the um, crust in these conduit style systems. So just a magma pathway. You have to saturate the magma with a sulfide, which makes these little sulfide droplets that float around in these conduits. They then concentrate all of the metals as they move through the silicate liquid. They um, attract all the metals and become enriched in metal content. And then for it to be mineable, you need to concentrate these sulfides into an accumulation, a body that's mineable. The right sort of scale, the right sort of abundance yeah. of it, yeah. So the sulfide is actually scavenging those metals out of the melt. Yeah, definitely. And that's actually how the indicator minerals indicate sulfide saturation. Okay, so these, these elements become concentrated in the metals, in the, in the sulfide, liquid mm -hmm. and are removed from the silicate magma. So okay. our minerals reflect the chemical process. Yeah. Okay. So what type of minerals then should we be looking for? So we're looking at the common minerals that occur in these mafic and ultra mafic um, intrusions. So we're looking at things like olivine, clinoperoxines, orthoperoxines, and chromite, and then some more unusual minerals such as apatite and arsenite. And all of these minerals can give you um, chemical signatures that show that sulfide saturation, or at least that you're in sort of a conduit style system. Okay. So there is potential for metal enrichment. Yep. So it's it's not just like strange little minerals that might float around occasionally. You're actually looking at the main mineralogy of these rocks themselves, right? Yeah. They're mostly made up of those, mm. those minerals. Mm. So um, they create the best target for us. So if we can because there will be a lot of them around. So if there's something, if there's a signature we can see, then we should be able to use those minerals to indicate that we're in the right area for a sulfide deposit. So then what causes that variation in chemistry between uh, like uh, a fertile or versus a more barren magmatic body? What, what, is, what, is a, what is the chemical process which leads to that variation? And what are the indicators in the minerals themselves that you see? What's the chemical kind of changes that you see? So what we're looking for is the indication of sulfide saturation. And these okay. sulfides like to take elements that are called chalcophile elements. So they love sulfide is the definition of chalcophile. Chalcophile, so, exactly. Yeah. So those elements are the ones that are usually depleted in these minerals. So if you look at things like olivine, they could have very, very low nickel contents because the nickel is um, stolen by the sulfides, basically. Yep. Yep. And then one of the studies that was published recently is looking at the platinum group elements mm -hmm. in chromite and spinels. So these platinum group elements are also very highly chalcophile. And so their levels are severely depleted in systems that contain sulfide. Right. So when you have no elements in your common rock forming minerals, that tells you that that uh, intrusion has or that that magma has deposited those the nickel and, and PGEs and so on somewhere else is that's the principle of it? 
Yeah, basically. If it if those elements are very, very low in the minerals, yeah. then they're probably somewhere else concentrated yeah. in a sulfide. Okay, so how do you follow the breadcrumbs then? So that's something that we're um, trying to look at over the next little while. Mm -hmm. We are recognizing these signatures in situ in the rocks when they're next to sulfides. But what we need to determine now is how they exist through the weathering profile, especially oh, yeah, in for Australia. Sure, for sure, yep, the weathering, yep. So most of the work I've been doing is in till type environments where there's less weathering going yep. on. So we're trying to bring bring the technologies back to Australia and look at how these minerals survive in the regolith. Yeah, right. Um, so the, so in the studies you've done so far, you've been mostly looking at in, in a mine kind of scale environment. So you, is that the sort of scale? I mean, you're not talking like that, that you're sampling kilometres or tens of kilometres away from an, an ore body. You're actually so far been sampling quite close to that. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Most of the mineral signatures we've been recognizing are either in the binary system of yes. in an intrusion that can, contains no sulfide yep. or in an intrusion that is known to contain sulfides. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. they can be away from the sulfides a little bit, but in the same known ore body. Ore body. Okay, ore zone. So what kind of analysis techniques are you using to, to determine the, the chemistry of these minerals? So in the published literature, mostly people use microprobe and laser ablation mm. to measure these trace elements. We're trying to move towards technologies that are a little bit more accessible to the mining and exploration industries. So these include technologies like the XRF mapper technologies that, are, that make these sorts of maps behind me. Nice map. Chemical, <laughs> chemical maps. Fantastic colors, um, yeah. Yeah, that make these... Maps that you can interpret chemistry mm, and texture mm. straight from an unpolished yeah, yep. sample. Oh, okay, unpolished. So straight out, of, straight off the jewelry, you can just cut a little piece. I presume you need to make it smaller. You don't just stick a whole core in there, do you? Or no, actually, you can put half core. So half it has core. To be a oh flat, my gosh. Flat surface. Okay. But half core up to about thirty centimeters yep. Yep. into yep. these yep. Um, devices, and it can measure. The, the scanning rates probably like a half core you can do in about nine hours or seven yep, yep, hours. Yep. But it, it requires no sample preparation. Yeah, so fantastic. Saving, saving a lot of time at that stage. Yep, definitely. And I guess the, the advantage of that also is the textural context for your samples. So maybe a, a spreadsheet with laser ablation spots or microprobe analyses is sort of divorced from the texture, whereas this obviously we can see from the image behind you how you know, how spectacular that is. And you can see front, chemical fronts and so on in all these minerals. It must be great for interpreting this data. Yeah, definitely. And it also has the advantage of being able to analyze sparse grains. So mm -hmm. if you had three chromite grains in a whole slab of drill core, then you could definitely analyze those mm -hmm. three sparse grains mm -hmm. rather than missing them if you have to make smaller micro samples. Sure, definitely, definitely. What So in terms of advantage of the technique as well, then, you know, traditionally, or, or traditionally is a, probably a silly word, but just like generally people will use a whole rock geochemistry and your whole rock geochemistry will tell you whether it has a certain PPM of nickel or PPM of cobalt or whatever. Is that not enough? Or do you think that this, this these techniques really have that power to be able to differentiate where the nickel sits in the in the mineralogy? So the the goal of these technologies is to have them used in tandem, basically. Mm -hmm. So Good you'll way. never get rid of never get rid of using magnetics or whole rock geochemistry. We're not trying to get rid of them, but we're just adding to the information that you get. So when you use whole rock, there's some um, confusion when there's alteration involved, mm -hmm. when there's weathering involved, when you get more complex systems with multiple mineralogy getting the like baseline of what is an unmineralized sample is a little bit more difficult. So just having an extra tool in these indicator minerals would be useful and beneficial definitely, for exploration. Definitely. I'm, I mean, I'd be very interested in how you think that this work might be able to be used in a, in a greenfields environment as well. I think that's probably sounds like a big frontier as well. Yeah, we're definitely moving towards mm. trying to get these technologies actually physically applicable to greenfields exploration. Fantastic. Um, so you've done a lot of work on these um, Archean Commodiite systems as well, or you and I guess the gr the broader group that you're part of, right? So what what do you, what what are you currently working on, and where do you see the future work? Where do you, where do you see this um, you know taking off next? Yeah. So we've recently been awarded a grant through the Minerals Research Institute of Western Australia mm -hmm. to continue this research into intrusion hosted systems within Western Australia. 
So we have a nice big team here at CSIRO and a whole bunch of industry collaborators who are going to give us some samples in Western Australia so we can make sure these indicator mineral signals are applicable in Western Australia and through the regolith and actually useful for exploration at the end of this two-year project. Well, fingers crossed we hear all about it. I, th I can't wait. I think it's a fantastic to be able to use. The individual mineralogy is going to tell you so much more than just a bulk chemical uh, or a complement, I guess, but tells you a lot more than the bulk chemical analysis. And I think it's an absolutely fantastic future technology and hopefully leads to lots of discoveries. So I really appreciate your time, Louise. Thanks very much for talking with me. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me.